Good morning and welcome to worship. Would you stand and join me as you're able in singing, I sing the almighty power of God. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It is wonderful to see all of your smiling faces here this morning. Thank you for bringing the church into this space. If you're joining us online, welcome. We are so glad that you chose to join us in worship today. My name is Luann. This is Lauren. We are, are on staff here. Um, I have to make a, a quick note. I think, Lauren, one of us has to change. Because I know that at the next service that Mark Rosser will give us a hard time about have on gator colors. And that just shouldn't be. Well, (laughs) just a few laughs this morning. Well, as we continue in our worship, we have these connect cards. We want to let you know these are in the back of the seat chairs. This is a great way for you to get connected into the life of the church. Lauren's going to share some announcements with us. If you have any questions about any of those announcements or you would like to receive emails about things that are happening in the life of the church, just fill out that Connect card. You can bring it to myself or Lauren or just place it in one of the giving boxes. Lauren, you've got some announcements for us. Yeah, we got just a few announcements today. Uh, Starting off strong with back to groups. We're going back to groups this Wednesday. Uh, At 6.30, we got something for kids, youth, and adults. uh, So the whole family can come out. Um, And we just wanted to highlight Alpha is also starting up very soon. It's not even in the Back to Groups brochure because it's so fresh and fun and new. (laughs) Um, But Luann actually led Alpha, and she was telling me that it's just a really amazing, like, overview of our faith. It's great for asking questions. Um, So, Luann, anything else you want to mention about Alpha? You know, as as you said, it really is a great foundation of the faith. So whether you've been in church for a long time or um, or new to faith. It is a great foundation um, of what we believe. But also, I think for me, you know, the, the strong emphasis on the Holy Spirit, it was an incredible um, time, a lot of great conversation. And so I strongly encourage people to participate in Alpha if you've not done that before. Yeah, awesome. So pick up a brochure, check out the groups, and look out um, on our website. There will be more information about Alpha very soon. 
Uh, but next up, we just want to remind you that the Young at Heart Gospel Sing is coming up on the 26th, and Friday is the last day to RSVP. Um, so now is the time where, like, maybe you do want to take your phone out during church and text Carolyn that you're coming right now. Um, so you don't forget, because it's going to be a lot of fun. And then finally, the choir is looking for new members. Shout out Justine. She's a really cool girl, guys. Um, so <laughs> if you can sing Wednesday at 515, the choir is kicking off again. So make sure you come out and join. Uh, but that's all the announcements I have for you guys. You can check out your bulletin, check out our website, or come find either one of us after service. All right. Thank you, Lauren. One of the great privileges that I have here at Deer Lake is to be able to lead something that we call Base Camp. Base Camp is a way for new people to be able to explore membership here at Deer Lake to find out more about our church, our church family, and ways that we can get plugged in and to serve and to grow in our faith. Next hymn is My Hope is Built. Join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. 
So over the last couple of months, we have been renovating uh, what we refer to as our administrative building. Uh, it is where our elementary kids meet on Sunday mornings. We've been renovating that to turn that into uh, less of an administrative building and more into a children's wing. Uh, and I am pleased to tell you, it is almost done, y'all. We are almost there. And when you see it, finally, you're not going to recognize it. Uh, we, we will no longer have children meeting in the administrative building. We'll have administration meeting in the children's building. And I absolutely love that. I can't wait for it to be done. We're really, really close. But in the meantime, uh, we've been doing these kids' messages. Um, and so I'm going to invite any of the kids up who would like to come and hear a special message just for them. Come on up. I don't want to sit up here on the stage all by myself. That will be super weird. Uh, but if anyone wants to come up here and join me, that would be awesome. And while they're making their way here, if any of you would like to serve them, if anyone would like to come and volunteer in our kids' ministry, uh, we're building this whole you know, new building out for it. The only thing it's missing is you. Uh, we've got all the space, we've got all the things, but we need probably about eight to ten more volunteers every Sunday. Uh, and so I would ask that you prayerfully consider that. Uh, the kind of, what we would love to see is folks go to traditional and then volunteer at 1030. And folks who go to 1030 come volunteer and serve at 9 o'clock. And so I'm just going to put that out there while I talk to these amazing people. What's up, my man? How old do you have to be to volunteer? I think we can find some space for y'all to volunteer. Absolutely. I got my first volunteer. Come on, y'all. Come on. Anyway, and one of the things we, we joke, we, we try not to call volunteers volunteers. We, we're calling them committed disciples. Uh, and so we, we really want to see folks step in like that. So thank you for that, Sebastian. That was awesome. I didn't even ask you to do that. That was perfect. I love it. So I, I want to show you guys this thing on this. Actually, you can see it up there or you can see it back there. What do you see up there on either screen? What is that? What does that look like? Lauren, can I steal your microphone? It looks like an ocean. Okay. A rocky beach. Yeah. Yeah, anyone out, any adults? Go, go, come on up here. Anyone else want to take a shot at it? What is that exactly? It's a specific body of water. Anyone want to guess? Where? That is exactly right. Whoever said the Dead Sea, that is the Dead Sea. You're like, that is like the worst named place on the planet, right? Why do you think, kids, why do you think it's called the Dead Sea? Anyone want to take a shot? Y'all are so quiet today. Come on up here. Yeah, come on, one more. There we go. Why do you think it's called the Dead Sea? Uh, maybe because, um, uh, um, because like, all the fish are dead in it and like, everything's dead in it. You're close. <laughs> look at that. Look how beautiful it looks. Doesn't that look beautiful? Don't you want to just go swim in the water? Well, guess what? If you jumped in the water, you got something. Is it polluted? It's not really polluted. What it is, someone already said it. Poison? It's salty. Salty. Oh, good job. <laughs> so it is about 10 times as salty as the ocean we go swim in here. About 10 times as much salt in there. And it's so salty that you can almost like just float on it. It's crazy, but because it's so salty, nothing can live in it. No fish, no animals, nothing. So they call it the Dead Sea. Dead sea. Yeah. Okay, so it's super salty. Now here's my next question. You guys are, I'm like, I'm not coming up here if I'm getting drilled with questions. Why do you think it's so salty? What do you think? Maybe because a meteor crashed into Earth in that spot and made a huge crater in the meteor maybe it had like a lot of salt, or there was like salt in the crater. I like your answer better than the real one. <laughs> All right? Anybody else? Who knows? That maybe there's some, there could be that. Anyone else? Why do you think it's so salty? Go for a it. A salt bomb exploded. A salt bomb exploded. Too many of those bath bombs dropped in. <laughs> one more guess, anybody. Why is it so salty? Can I tell you why? The Dead Sea has a lot of different rivers and streams that flow into it. 
but nothing that it flows into. Everything pours into the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea doesn't pour into anything. Scientists think it used to be connected to the Mediterranean, but then it got cut off. And after all those years of everything pouring into it, pouring into it, pouring into it, pouring into it, and all that salt and all that sediment going into it, it had nowhere to go, and it just got saltier and saltier and saltier and saltier. And I think this is a great image for us, because as a Christian, one of the things we talk about is we're not just people who receive from God. We get to be people who give in response to God. We get to serve others. We get to show kindness. And so I want to encourage you. God has poured out his love into us, but I don't want us to just receive that love. We want to be people who share that love. Otherwise, we might become like the Dead Sea and become really, 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 really salty. Salty. And so one of the ways we prevent from becoming too salty is by sharing and telling others about Jesus and showing kindness and living in the way of Jesus. And so here's what I want you to do at school this week, okay? I want you to try to think of one way that the love you receive from God you can share that with others. That sound good? You guys were super quiet today, but I'm so glad you guys came up, okay? All right, would somebody like to pray for us? Would one of y'all like to pray for us? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much, and we thank you for pouring your grace in us. Help us to become people who pour that grace, that kindness, that love out so that, God, we don't become like the Dead Sea, so that we don't become too salty. We love you, and we bless you, and we pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's children said, amen. Amen. All right, y'all can go back to your seats, and I believe Justine has some special music for us today, okay? Great job, guys. Before my husband Michael and I share the anthem with you this morning, I just want to read this beautiful text of the piece we'll be doing by Dan Forrest. This is a text by Joanna Anderson, and she writes, In the shadow where we linger, in this darkness we call home, where the sighs are deep and doubtful and our aspirations grown, all is not in vain, beloved. Our travail is not unknown. Christ within us, Christ among us, Christ the first and Christ the last. Love incarnate, hold your children till the storm of life is past. Though we have not faith to always seek him, Christ himself will draw us near. Deep, abiding rays of mercy cast their light on lonely fear. Cry no more, ye poor and weary, our redeeming Lord is here. Christ within us, Christ among us, Christ the first and Christ the last. Love incarnate, hold your children till the storm of life is past. Sure defender, never failing, radiant savior, holy friend, gift of glory, hope of heaven. Call us now to faith again. Alleluia, blessed compassion. Grace is shining without end. Christ within us, Christ among us, Christ the first, Christ the last. Love incarnate, hold your children till the storm of life is past. The shadow where we linger in the darkness we call home, where the sighs are deep and doubtful, and our aspirations grow. All is not 
in vain, beloved. Our travail is not unknown. Christ within us, Christ among us, Christ the first and Christ the last. Love incarnate, hold your children till the storm of life is past. Though we have not faith to seek him, Christ himself will draw us near, deep abiding rays of mercy, cast the light on lonely fear, cry no more, ye poor and weary, our redeeming Lord is here. Christ within us, Christ among us, Christ the first and Christ the last. Love incarnate, hold your children till the storm of life is past. Sure defense. of glory, hope of heaven, call us now to faith again. Alleluia, blessed companion, race is shining without end. Christ within us, Christ the first and Christ the last love incarnate hold your children till the storm of life is a Amen. Thank you, Michael and Justine, for sharing your gift of song. It is absolutely beautiful, and I know it blesses the heart of God. Well, we continue now in our worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Here at Deer Lake, we give to God through the church. We have a variety of ways that you can give, including in person through our giving boxes or also online. Just click on the giving tab on our website. But each week, some of the things that we like to do is to give praise to God for things that are happening in the life of the church. But today, I want to give praise for something that is coming up on September 15th. On September 15th, we are having something that we are calling Back to Church Sunday. We know how powerful it can be to share our faith and our community with others. And this is an opportunity for our church family to invite your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your family, um, anyone to come and to join us and to experience what we have here at Deer Lake. And so I invite you to begin to pray about who you might invite to church on September 15th. 
So as we go to God in prayer this morning, let's lift up not only those individuals that we'll be praying for, but also uh, our offerings as well. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts, seeking your guidance as we aspire to become a more invitational church. Help us to reflect your love and hospitality in all we do. Inspire us to reach out with genuine warmth and welcome everyone who crosses our path. May our church be a place where all feel embraced by your grace and drawn closer to you. As we now bring our tithes and offerings, we ask that you would bless these gifts and use them to further your kingdom. Let them support our efforts to be a loving community. We offer those gifts with thankful hearts, trusting in your provision and guidance. In the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able and respond with me by singing the doxology. As, as Pastor Bobby shared with us, children are invited to remain here in the sanctuary. Lauren has some kids' worship bags available for you to pick up. But for everyone else, I'm going to invite you to greet someone and to answer this question, what brings you joy? And if greeting is not your jam, uh, we encourage you to go out and grab a cup of coffee or just take a minute to, to just reflect. And so meet someone you don't know. I can go ahead and have a seat. How are we doing today? What brings you joy? It's so good to see you all today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for bringing the church in this place. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, my name is Bobby. I am the pastor here. It is so good to see you all. Um, I wish I had time to sit with each of you and ask you what brings you joy, um, but I want to kind of use that question as a springboard into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so as we're all thinking about what brings us joy, I'm curious, have you ever thought about what brings God joy? What brings God joy? Have you ever thought about that? What brings God joy? Is it like faithfulness? Is it obedience to the law? Is it keeping all the rules, doing all the right things? What is it that brings God 
joy. Because here's the thing. The Bible talks a lot about what pleases God. Can we go to the pleasing slide, uh, Mike? Uh, we talk about a lot about what pleases God. I'm going to go one more slide, Mike. There we go. We'll get there. <laughs> One more slide. Oh, well, it's not in there, so don't worry about it. The Bible talks about a lot what pleases God. It talks about in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 11, that without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. It says in Psalm 147 that the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. It says in the book of 1 John, uh, that whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments and do what? What pleases him. The Bible talks a lot about pleasing God, but quite frankly, pleasing someone and bringing them joy are not necessarily the same thing. There are things that my children can do that please me on a regular basis. If they eat what I made for dinner, that, that pleases me. If I don't have to go two, three, four rounds in and they actually eat that, that, oh, that, that pleases me. If they go to bed, when I say to go to bed, and it doesn't take two hours for the bedtime process, that pleases me. If they do what I say the first time and not the 14th time, that pleases me. But there's a difference between pleasing and joy. And Jesus makes it clear that you and I have the power and capacity to bring God joy. Let's read and hear what it is that brings God joy. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Hear these words and listen for what brings God joy. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then J Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls all his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. God, help us to hear and understand today. Help us to receive and, and live out and obey your word. And God, if there's any areas of it today that we struggle to understand, God, help us in love and trust to stand under it anyway. God, we believe you, we trust you. Holy Spirit, help us to live out everything that you are calling us to today. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said We'll come back to what brings God joy in just a minute. Uh, if you were here last week, you know we read that entire chapter, all of Luke 15, that, uh, verse 1 all the way through the end. We heard the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the, uh, and the prodigal brothers, the two sons. And one of the things we no noted, and just to kind of give a little background here, is each of these stories in their own way follows a seven pattern kind of flow a seven-element flow. Here they are, okay, just in case you missed it, each one of them follows a seven pattern. And it's, there's someone who loves, there is something that is loved, that something loved is lost, that something lost is sought, that something sought is found, that something found is restored, and that something restored is celebrated, it is rejoiced over. Each one of these stories follows that seven fold pattern, that same movement, but it does it in their own unique way. Jesus isn't telling the exact same story three different times. He's telling us three similar stories, each one a diff with a different emphasis, like a different rubber band that stretches a little bit different so that we can understand uh, different aspects 
of this thing that Jesus is trying to help us understand. He's trying to help us understand that there is a God who seeks us and pursues us and loves us. And this first story about the miss- missing sheep is no different. It follows that pattern, but it does it in its own unique way. And so I want us to look at this first element here. I want us to be thinking about who is Jesus talking to? Listen again. It says, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. Who is the them? Who is the you? Who is he talking to? Well, we know at the beginning of the text, it says that Jesus is eating and, te- eating and teaching who? He's, he's spending time with the sinners and tax collectors. They're drawing near to them. And there's a group of people who has a problem with that. Who's the people that have the problem with that? The Pharisees and the scribes. They're looking at who Jesus is hanging out with. And they take issue. Now, I want to be clear here. The Pharisees and scribes, the religious leaders, did not look at the sinners and tax collectors and just say to themselves, we're better than them. That's the problem. It's much more nuanced than that. I'm not saying there wasn't that there, but it was much more nuanced than that. Okay? The sinners and tax collectors, in the eyes of the Pharisees and scribes, in the eyes of the religious leaders of the day, they had multiple problems with them. One, for them, for the, sinners, for the Pharisees and scribes, These people are not living out God's law as God has commanded it. They are not as faithful as they're supposed to be, and their concern as people trying to be as faithful as they're supposed to be is that if they get too close, they're going to get contaminated. You've heard the parable or the the proverb, uh, bad company corrupts what? Good character. So their fear is if we get too close to them and we start eating with them, rubbing elbows with them, they're going to rub off on us, not the other way around. This is their fear. The other fear, the other fear, is that in the mind of the Pharisees, in the mind of the religious leadership of that day, this was not uh, across every religious group, but the specific groups mentioned here, part of the issue is that in their mind, the way God is going to come restore them again, the way God is going to come drive out the Romans is if everybody starts living faithfully. Obey God's law. Obey God's word perfectly. Once we do that, God will come and drive out the Romans. And so they're looking at the sinners and tax collectors and saying, they're not doing that. So in the eyes of the Pharisees, in the eyes of the religious leaders of the day, the, the, the sinners and tax collectors just aren't dropping the ball in their own sort of personal piety. Their issue with them is that these are the very people who are the reason why God has not come to rescue us yet. The reason the Romans are still here is because of people like them. So I say all that because I think it's easy just to brush off the Pharisees and brush off the scribes and just say they're prideful and arrogant. Well, there might have been that too. And they might have looked at the the sinners and tax collectors and said, oh, thank goodness I'm not like them. But it was much more involved than that. And so when we say, when, it, when Jesus says, when the scripture says he spoke to them and said, suppose one of you, the sinners or tax collectors are there. They can hear this. But who's he talking to? He's talking to the people raising the complaint. He's talking to the people who are objecting. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders, this is a direct story to them. It's an indirect story to the sinners and tax collectors. They're hearing it, but it's being spoken to the Pharisees and tax uh, Pharisees and sinners. And here's why this is important. Listen to the next li- listen to the next slide. We can look at this a little bit. Okay. It says, suppose one of you. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. He's talking to the religious establishment and says, suppose one of you loses one. He could, Jesus could have said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off. Where's the blame there? On the one that wanders off. Where is he putting the blame for the lost sheep? Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one of them. 
Jesus is not blaming the sheep right now. He's blaming the shepherds. Now, y'all, as someone who loves God's word and who's read this story a million times, I never noticed that before. If you would have asked me to tell you this story, just from memory, I would say, oh, yeah, Jesus says, hey, suppose one of you had 100 sheep and one of them wanders off. Doesn't say one of them wanders off. He says, suppose one of you has 100 sheep and you lost one. Jesus primarily places the blame for the lostness of the sheep, not on the sheep, but on the shepherd. Now, this doesn't mean the sheep don't have any responsibility here. All right? We're going to talk a lot more about the responsibility of the sheep who are later represented as a coin and then later represented as two boys. We're going to do that two weeks from now when we look at the stories of the prodigal brothers. Okay? But for today, let's just name this. What kind of role do sheep have in getting lost? I'll give you one word. They get distracted. Jesus is actually exposing the failures of the shepherds more than he's exposing the failures of the sheep. But if you're going to put one blame on the sheep, it's that they get distracted. Sheep want to be guided. They want to be led. But oh my goodness, the grass on the other side of that hill looks delicious. They get distracted. That, if we're going to take this story, we can't stretch it too far. But that's the fault of the sheep. They get distracted. Distracted. You want know to know what it's like? How many of y'all love going to the beach? How many of y'all can sit in the water for hours, floating around? Have you ever noticed that when you get out there and you're just having fun, and then all of a sudden you look up and it's been an hour or two, you're nowhere near where you started? You know what I'm talking about? It's every parent's worst nightmare, right? Like you're, you're doing your thing and the kids are like, oh, be right in front of you. And you look up and now they're half a mile down the beach. Why? It wasn't because they were like, I hate my mom and dad, and I would like to get as far away from them down this coast as I can. No, they were having fun, and they got what? Distracted. I will never forget family vacation, seeing my dad way out there, not because he wanted to see how far he could go out, but because him and the people out there got distracted. So when we're talking about the responsibility of the sheep here, sheep get distracted. Now, Let's go back to the ocean metaphor. The ocean don't care if you got distracted or if you just wanted to see how far you could go out, does it? That distracted person who just gets pulled into the, uh, uh, you know, the tide or whatever and they go further and further out, the ocean's like, oh my goodness, you just got distracted? You didn't, you didn't want, this wasn't a pride thing, this wasn't a hostility thing, you just let me push you back in. You know, the consequences for the distracted are still destruction. But it changes the way we approach their lostness, doesn't it? I heard a pastor say a couple weeks ago, I just thought this was brilliant. He said he walked outside and saw his toddler uh, using a rock to write on the concrete. You ever notice you can take a rock and it'll like kind of write, turns white. And you praise them and applaud them. And you're like, oh, good, you're so creative, have fun. Turned around for five seconds, the toddler's now using it on his car. He said this. He said, we don't discipline for mistakes. We discipline for sin. He said, that child needed to understand, we don't do that. He didn't know that was wrong. You can't, I can't punish him for that. If he does it again, now it's no longer a mistake. Now it's a willful, de willful decision. That's a different story. He said, but what my child needed from me in there in that moment was not punishment but grace. It was a moment to teach him. He's like, it took a lot in me to not do what I wanted to do. The sheep get distracted. Jesus puts the blame on the religious people. He says, y'all were the shepherds instructed with their care. Yes, they got distracted, but that's on you. He's not nullifying the responsibility of the sheep, but he's placing greater emphasis on the role that the shepherds have played by not shepherding well. And what Jesus is actually doing, he's stepping into a long prophetic tradition. Go read Jeremiah. Go read the prophet Ezekiel. Go read the prophet Zechariah. Each one of them has 
lengthy uh, rebukes by the prophets to the religious leaders for failing to shepherd the people well. Let me read you just real briefly this piece from Ezekiel chapter 34. It says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should you not shepherd Uh, Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, the clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. You benefit from it, but you don't take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. Jeremiah has very similar words. The prophet Zechariah has very similar words. Jesus primarily places the locus of blame, not on the sheep for their failings and their mistakes, on the shepherds. And this is, where the sh- this is where the story shifts. He says, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and you lose one. Wouldn't you go after it? To which we're all actually supposed to reply, no. Because they haven't been. So here's what Jesus does. The story shifts, and he now becomes the one who is seeking the sheep. He is now the good shepherd. He is the one pursuing the lost. He is the one going after them. And so the very thing that the Pharisees and scribes are upset about, this table fellowship where Jesus is drawing in people, who would never, ever feel welcome at the tables of the religious leaders. He's drawing them to himself. Why? Because he is the good shepherd in pursuit of the lost. And look what it says. When Jesus says the shepherd finds the sheep, what does he do? He rejoices over that lost sheep. He throws it over his shoulders, and he carries it home. He then invites, has a big old party, and he invites his friends and neighbors to come and celebrate. Why? Because joy does what judgment cannot. Joy can accomplish. Joy does what judgment cannot. Jesus at no, no point says, yes, it is good that the sheep are lost. No, it's terrible. It's a horrible thing. But he says, joy can accomplish bringing them home in a way judgment can not. There's this really cool thing in here. I'm running out of time, y'all, but we're having so much fun. He says he puts them on his shoulders, and he goes home, he carries it home joyfully. And who does he invite over? His friends and his neighbors. Uh, There's a book called The Good Shepherd. It should be in your bulletin, I believe, as a resource. Wonderful resource. If you've ever been curious about all those Good Shepherd texts, highly recommend it. It's a little on the heavier reading side. Brilliant. Never knew this. There was a group of Pharisees who were like the elite force of the Pharisees. It was like the, the everyday Pharisees who tried to keep the law as best they could, and then there was like the next level, the guys who even took it even serious, more seriously. You want to know what their name was? Why don't know what they called themselves in Hebrew? The friends. That's literally what they called themselves, the friends. And Kenneth Bailey, who wrote the book, The Good Shepherd, he says, there is no first century Pharisee who would have heard Jesus say they invited their friends over to celebrate, who would have not picked up what Jesus is putting down, what he's actually saying. He's saying to the Pharisees, he's saying to the scribes, he's saying to the people who have said, I will not chase them, I will not seek them, I will not go after them. He's saying, hey, it's not too late. There's room for you to join me at this. There's room at the table for you too. This is not me for the sinners and tax collectors against you. No, there, there is, the table's big enough. Come, let's do this together. And so here's what I want to do. I got 10 key takeaways that there's no way we can cover, okay? So what I want you to do is if you have a phone that can take pictures, I want you to take pictures of the next two things. I'm going to just read through these really, really fast, and here's what I want you to do. This week, I want you to try to, if you can, I want you to reflect on one of these things 
that brings you peace and reflect on one of these things that stirs up problems for you, that steps on your toes, that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. One thing that comforts you and speaks deep joy to you, one thing that steps on your toes and makes you a little uncomfortable. Here are 10 takeaways I think we want to listen to here. One, the sheep play a part in lostness that Jesus places primary blame on the religious leaders who have failed to seek them. Jesus takes issue with those who value their own personal piety, purity, over and at the cost of the pursuit of the lost. Those who refuse to seek the lost are lost as well. That's part of the reason why Jesus welcomes the, the friends. It's what his way of saying, hey, you can come back too. Jesus invites Pharisee and sinner to repent, to come home to the joy-filled embrace of God. Anyone who returns to God is welcomed with joy. You want to know what brings God joy? That was the question, right? What brings God joy is when his people come home. Whether they're lost in sin or whether they're lost in the sin of self-righteousness, whenever someone comes home, to the loving embrace of God, they come home to joy. You want to know what brings God joy? Coming home to the Father. We bring God joy by coming home, allowing him to save us, and joining his pursuit of the lost. Joy does what judgment cannot. Jesus values the repentant return of the lost over and above private purity. Regardless of where you are in the story, now is a perfect time to return to the God who seeks you and finally the search comes at great cost to the shepherd. I'm going to have to read in between the lines here. We, we read the story, but we don't necessarily hear all that's involved with the seeking, with the searching. There in the, in the book uh, by Kenneth Bailey, he reads some personal accounts of shepherds who went seeking their lost sheep in the wilderness. And one of the stories just really struck with me. He said when they realized one of their sheep was missing, it was late. And even though it was late, they lit a candle, they lit their lanterns, and they went seeking the sheep in the middle of the night in the wilderness. They could hear wolves, but they couldn't find the sheep, so they kept searching. And because it was dark and they couldn't see anything and they just had their lamp, they kept stumbling into briars and thorns. He said to just rip their clothing apart from top to bottom, just tattered and torn, calling out for the sheep. And then when they were just about to give up, they called out again and heard their sheep crying. And so in the dark, they continued to push through with just their little lamp until they found their sheep. And when they did, it said they, they were overjoyed. And they carried it home rejoicing, tattered, torn, bleeding, exhausted. Seeking the sheep comes at great cost to the shepherd. And we know that Jesus Christ will live, he will die, he will rise again in pursuit of his lost sheep. And so I want to echo what Sharin said earlier. If you have not come back to the Father, if you have not let him rescue you, may today be the day that you allow the loving embrace of our good shepherd to welcome you home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we adore you. And we pray, oh God, God, that we would recognize that your joy, that joy can do what judgment cannot. And so, God, help us to have hearts that are overwhelmed by your goodness and kindness, to extend that to others so that they might know the joy of being found by you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, we pray, and all God's children said, amen. Would you please stand as we sing our closing hymn together? Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
thou has loved us, love us still. This is not Jesus for the sinners and tax collectors and against the Pharisees. And this is not Jesus for the Pharisees and religious elite and against the sinners and tax collectors. This is a love deep and wide enough with an embrace so joyful that makes room and space for all and any who will receive it. So if you want to know what brings God joy, what thrills the heart of God, it's when the lost come home to the warm embrace of the Father. May you experience that joy each and every day. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing the church in this place. It's been a joy to worship with you. Church service is over, but being the church is just beginning. So go and be the church for the glory of God and the sake of the world. Go in peace.